the blockchain three session. Um, we have three papers in today's session. Uh, to kick this off, we have Dominic Cajas from Imperial College London. Uh, his talk will be on dynamic adjustment of cryptocurrency deposit. Thank you. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Dominic. I work at the Imperial College in London, and today I will be talking about our balance protocol, how to dynamically adjust cryptocurrency deposits. And this is joint work together with uh, Lewis, Arthur, and Will from our cryptocurrency lab. All right, so blockchains are a really great thing, right? Because we have Alice and Bob, and with the introduction of uh, these blockchains and uh, decentralized ledgers, neither Alice nor Bob need to trust each other to make payments between each other or have more complex interactions. So we can have these contracts and they are enforced by these consensus participants. However, there's a couple of problems with that, right? This comes at a certain cost. So uh, there's a lot of research going on how to make this more scalable and how to make it cheaper. So what's happening right now is that there's these protocols that are built on top of the ledger and we create these optimistic interactions. So um, what happens quite often is that um, if we say that Alice is a service provider and Bob receives some sort of service, then Alice pays a deposit D into this protocol to participate. And this deposit is essentially a security for Bob. Um, so if we assume that Alice is economically rational, then we want to Alice to behave according to the rules of the protocol because she has paid that deposit and if she would misbehave, then we would basically destroy her deposit. So she has some skin in the game. Well, there we need to really ensure that this is actually secure and we do have some example protocols there. Um, so for example, there's Xclaim, FirstWap, Truebit, or Nocus, and several others that follow this very basic principle. Um, right, but what's the problem with using deposits? So I don't know who of you has uh, a lot of coins laying around that you don't use, but essentially locking up deposit is quite costly. So um, you have a certain opportunity cost for keeping these coins locked up in a protocol. And also what you're having is certain uh, uncertainty about the uh, the amount of deposit that you're actually needing um, because of two factors that will I will explain in more detail and because usually you don't have really an exact amount of deposit that you can put in. So let's look at the uncertainty factors. So when you pay a deposit, um, you require that at the beginning of the protocol. And now we need to account for this event dependency and uh, I think uh, almost no one uh, got around to hear about the big price fluctuations that happen in the cryptocurrency world. So somehow we need to account for these price fluctuations in the beginning of a protocol while this deposit is still there. And on the other hand, Alice might have some private information. So uh, let's say Alice uh, also is invested in another competitor protocol. So Alice might actually want to harm your protocol and doesn't really care about losing her deposit in your protocol. Um, or we heard earlier this morning, bribing is a thing. So if Alice gets some bribe to misbehave, um, then we also need to account for this. And how this is usually done in practice is that agents need to over collateralize. So essentially, uh, instead of paying 100% collateral, you usually have a higher amount of collateral that you need to pay. And this actually happens in practice. So for example, in the uh, stablecoin DAI, there's around 300, uh, sorry, 650 million US dollar locked, and this has a deposit ratio of between 350% and 600% over the last year. So this is real money that's locked, um, and this is a real opportunity cost for agents like Alice. So Alice is sort of paying and missed out opportunities because, well, obviously Alice could also take these coins that are locked under collateral and invest in some other protocols or do cryptocurrency trading. There's another certain problem um, between the motivation and how to set the deposit size. So Alice, who's a service provider, obviously uh, we just saw uh, if she locks a lot of collateral, then this incurs a cost for her. Um, so Alice would probably like lower deposits. But on the other hand, our user, Bob, 
um, who is a receiver of the service, he obviously wants to have protection against misbehavior of Alice. And for Bob, the more deposit that Alice actually pays into the, into the contract, the more security, assuming rational agents, uh, Bob has from Alice. So we, we have this dilemma of opposing motivations and how to set the protocol. Now, what we set out to do in our balance protocol is actually, can we somehow lower the amount of deposit? So can we make this big pile of coins to a smaller pile of coins? Um, and can we make that in a, such a way that it's secure? So can we make Alice pay less collateral, but still keep the same security properties, the protection against economically rational Alice? We make five assumptions for our protocol. So first, we assume we have a ledger functionality in which we can implement our protocol. So balance is implemented as a smart contract. Um, we assume that the protocol that we integrate balance with is over collateralized. So we have more than 100% of collateral. Um, we assume that balance is integrated as an add-on to an existing protocol. So earlier, I talked about uh, Xclaim and Fairswap as examples. So we assume that balance is going to integrate into one of these protocols. And in fact, later I'll show how to integrate balance into Xclaim protocol. Um, we also assume that uh, within that protocol that we integrate in, we can actually publicly verify if Alice behaved correctly. So um, what usually happens in, in a protocol that we integrate with is that um, if Alice misbehaves, we can punish Alice. And we need to be able to extract that information um, in such a way that we can reflect that imbalance. And last but not least, we assume um, Alice is economically rational, so she will actually care about losing her deposit. With that, we get uh, four properties out of balance. So what proper balance gives you is uh, we can reduce the cost for locking collateral, so we can uh, reduce the collateral overall. Um, we can show that this is strategy proof, so there's no additional incentive for Alice to misbehave, even if her collateral is lowered. Um, we can also show that Bob doesn't need to care if Alice actually lowered her collateral or not. Um, she can, uh, sorry, Bob can choose um, whatever agent to interact with, no matter what deposit size or how much the deposit record reduction is. And last but not least, we also show that uh, the protocol is Sybil resistant. So uh, even if Alice would create multiple Sybil identities, uh, she cannot reduce her collateral uh, further or she doesn't profit from such a strategy. Right, I will now give a brief background about sort of the model and the protocols that we interact with and then introduce how balance actually achieves these properties. So uh, first, crypto economic protocols. It's a bit of a buzzword, um, so let me try to sort of explain what, what I mean by that. So in a crypto economic protocol, we essentially implement a mechanism, so built on, on game theory, and we have some sort of cryptographic specification. And what happens in a very generalized way is that Alice commits to such a protocol by paying her initial deposit. And then Alice is left with two choices. So either Alice can sort of perform a desired action, so the protocol basically has some sort of usually cryptographic specification that Alice needs to fulfill, and if Alice does so, then Alice gets paid, and when the interaction is completed, Alice can refund her deposit. Um, this execution phase can usually go over multiple rounds, so Alice would get paid multiple times if she does so. So that would be our desired outcome. On the other hand, Alice can also choose to violate the specification, um, and then we usually take away Alice's deposit. Um, but we said earlier, maybe Alice has some sort of private information, um, like a bribe, so we assign this value V um, to encode this motivation or to encode that value that Alice has for performing this uh, undesired outcome. And then what Alice is going to do, um, Alice is going to make a decision. And the decision is based on the incentives on both sides. So um, if the private value minus the deposit uh, actually gives Alice more uh, payoff, so say a higher amount of coins, um, if it's a bribing case, for example, then the payment that we receive, then Alice will go for the undesired outcome. Whereas if our payment is higher, then um, Alice will actually choose to perform the desired outcome. So 
these are the basic decisions and this is the condition that must hold that Alice actually behaves honestly, um, which more or less correlates with the definition of a rational adversary. So that the payoff for the honest action needs to be higher than the dishonest action. So how does balance now achieve these properties? So we saw here we have D and now we're gonna lower this D part. Um, how do we actually keep that secure? So <clears throat> in our protocol without balance, right? We have our three agents, Alice, Eve, and John, and they committed to the protocol. And now they sit here and they have committed 200% uh, of deposit. So all of them have paid 200% of the deposit. Now with balance, we're gonna add these layers. And uh, layers represent a certain level of deposit. Um, so we added this factor here. And essentially in layer one, we have a 200% deposit. Um, and for example, in layer three, we have a deposit of 175%. So if the agents move through these layers, they can reduce the deposit. And by reducing the deposit, we actually reduce the opportunity cost. So what the agents are trying to achieve is basically move through those layers. Um, and how they're gonna move through the layers is by executing these desired actions. So let's say uh, we started with all three agents in layer one, and now we are in the next time round. And then Alice and John performed desired actions so they can move to layer two and reduce their deposit. If we continue like that, say in the next time step, Alice does a nice action, and then she can move to layer three, reducing her deposit further. Um, now what happened is that uh, here, John, uh, who is at layer two, is now going back to layer one because he did something that we uh, didn't like, that the protocol that Balance is integrated with um, classified as an undesired action, so we're gonna throw him back and he has to increase his deposit again. Uh, Eve did a nice job and Alice is doing super great. She's in the uh, highest layer now in layer number four, where she has the lowest deposit rate. Um, so let's go through that in detail, how Alice is doing that. So we said in the beginning, uh, Alice is gonna commit to her 200% deposit level. And then over a couple of rounds, um, Alice performs actions and we record essentially these actions. So we are recording a score for Alice and by doing so, we allow her to, to transition through these layers. So essentially in every layer, we have some sort of score that Alice needs to achieve. And if she does so, we allow her to transition to the next layer. We also enforce that um, if Alice actually doesn't do anything within a certain round, we're gonna put her back um, to like a, a lower layer with a higher deposit level. So agents have to continuously do these desired actions. Um, and we don't give agents a uh, reputation over time, but they need to continuously interact with the protocol. And in the last step, Alice can withdraw her deposit when she's finished. And at that point, she, um, assuming she always did the desired action, she has lowered her deposit to like the, the lowest possible amount. Right. Um, I will talk about now how we are gonna make sure that this is actually secure. And for that, we need to sort of understand the uh, utilities and the payoffs uh, behind that protocol. So uh, if Alice is in layer one, right, she uh, has a decision between the desired action in the, for the blue arrow and the pinkish one for the undesired action. And if she does the desired action, she gets a payment P. Um, if she does the undesired action, she gets her private value for that uh, undesired action minus the deposit that she paid in the first layer. Now let's say Alice did the desired action and she's moving to the next layer. Then at that point, she has a decision again between desired and undesired action and uh, she would get the payment and would have to pay a little less penalty because we reduced her deposit. Um, same is gonna happen if she's in the topmost layer, she can just continuously interact there and get paid or if she does the undesired action, uh, she will get punished, but with a lower collateral. Now, so we have these uh, utilities simplified, but now we need to add one more thing. And that one more thing is the opportunity cost on that lock collateral. And this is what we're gonna express with this expected uh, opportunity cost. So we have a parameter R here, and R essentially encodes how much I, Alice could earn by participating in some other protocol. 
now we want to attack our own protocol. Um, so I think some of you might now come up with a strategy, you know, uh, what if Eve uh, joins our protocol and then Eve goes through those layers and then at the lowest, or well, layer number three, with the lowest collateral uh, cheats at that point and then she's just going to repeat that over and over again. Um, it would be kind of a sensible strategy in this case, right? Um, how do we prevent that? Well, the solution really is that we need to bind um, how much we can actually reduce to collateral. So we cannot reduce collateral to infinity or to zero. Um, we actually need to reduce the collateral uh, up to a lower bound. And we can calculate this lower bound. So if we look at that, um, essentially by Eve participating in these two steps, uh, Eve has a cost for that because she had to lock up her collateral for these two periods, um, which we can express with these uh, expected uh, lockup cost. And she gains uh, something additionally um, by losing less collateral. So essentially, uh, we, we have a gain uh, because we, by, by doing the undesired action, we pay less penalty. So now what we need to do is actually the gain that we can make from this layer cycling strategy uh, needs to be less than the cost of this layer cycling strategy. So we need something along this condition to hold. Uh, in the paper, it's a little bit more formal and we have a couple more parameters um, with which we can devise this lower bound. Um, this is the formula, more details in the paper. Um, but how it essentially works is that we can plot this decision bound and we're going to have on the left hand side here the deposit factor so between 210 percent and uh, 150 percent and on the uh, lower axis we have the number of layers and then we can plot that decision bound so that decision bound gives us the collateral factor per layer so here at uh, layer one or zero in this case um, we start with 200% collateral, and if we go all the way to layer 30, we are just below 170% collateral. And now what's going to happen is if we set the collateral factor above this decision bound, then Alice will choose a desired action if we assume that she's economically rational. So her payoff for um, choosing a desired action will be greater than choosing an undesired action. If, on the other hand, we set the, um, the collateral factor for a specific layer below this bound, then uh, for Alice, the rational choice to do is, is to execute the undesired action because her payoff will be greater for that. So all in all, we need to be carefully setting this decision bound. And I will show next uh, in evaluation. So we have a couple of parameters in this protocol. And now we're going to look at um, how those parameters affect actually the setting this collateral factor. So in total, we have four parameters. Uh, two we set in the uh, balance protocol, and two parameters are subjective to the agent. In balance, we set the total number of layers, um, and we set the deposit factor for each layer. Uh, the agent has to decide what's the opportunity cost, how much can the agent actually earn somewhere else? And also the agent will have a discount factor. So we're going to discount any kind of future earnings. Um, so we account for this time model. So the first graph that I'm going to show is how the number of layers behave on the collateral reduction. So um, the top red line here shows a balance for a configuration of five different layers. And we can see that we can uh, reduce the collateral only from 200% to about 190%. Whereas if you uh, look at the lower red line and the black line, you can see that um, we can actually reduce the collateral much further to about 170%. Um, we also show that if you set the number of layers towards infinity, there's an absolute lower bound on the collateral re reduction that you can achieve. Next are the, uh, the layer factors. And here we looked at what happens with the initial collateral factor that you can set. So here the black line shows us if we start with 200% of collateral, we can absolute um, our, no, sorry, the 
relative collateral reduction will be greater if we set a higher initial collateral rate and the absolute collateral that we achieve after 30 layers will be uh, higher. And also one interesting finding is, is that if we, if we don't have over collateralization, so if you have exactly 100% collateral, then you cannot reduce the collateral. Um, in a practical application case, for example, in the Lightning Network, um, you typically have exactly 100% collateral because you ensure the value of the channel. So, uh, for example, for the Lightning Network, this protocol would not be applicable. Uh, but for a range of Ethereum-based protocols where you have, in fact, over-collateralization, this is uh, quite applicable. Then, um, now we go to the agent parameters. And we talk about the rate of return. And the rate of return, this also has a sort of an interesting uh, finding. So if the agent actually expects that he can get a quite large return from some other protocol, we can quite aggressively reduce the collateral. However, if there's, for example, no other protocol deployed on the same blockchain and I cannot invest my coin in something else and I don't want to do trading, um, and we assume that R is zero so I cannot earn any money, then we actually can also not reduce the collateral in the protocol. So we need to be careful in considering what actually other opportunities an agent has. And as a last parameter, the discount factor, um, we do have sort of the notion that an agent can discount future, future earnings. So if the agent uh, discounts any kind of future income quite aggressively, what we can see with the red line here, so basically, any future uh, return would only be 75% of the today's value, um, then we can only reduce the collateral less. And the black line represents uh, just a 5% reduction of, um, or 5% discount on the future value, and then we can reduce the collateral more aggressively. As a closing, I will talk about how to apply this to the Xclaim protocol. Xclaim is a protocol that was introduced in SMP uh, earlier this year. And um, Xclaim essentially has three different sub protocols. Um, the core idea is that you bring these uh, Bitcoin backed tokens onto Ethereum. And Xclaim allows interoperability between the two um, by using a collateralized third party that moderates uh, two of these protocols, the issue and the redeem protocol. In a very, very abstract sense, that probably doesn't do the paper much justice right now, but um, Alice essentially commits to a deposit to moderate the protocol, and then X, uh, Alice interacts with the Xclaim protocol, um, and she can earn some fees doing that, and then she pays out, gets her deposit back when she's finalized with that. Now, if we add balance, um, in this case, balance would be implemented as a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, we would use balance to essentially manage and maintain the deposit level that Alice has to pay. So in that case, uh, Alice would pay her initial deposit, but then over time, uh, when she executes desired action, according to the definition of the x time protocol, then we would allow Alice to lower her deposit and she can withdraw parts of her deposit. And in the end, when she's finished, uh, she just takes the remainder of her deposit out. We basically um, implemented this as a smart contract. It's open source, uh, so you can access it. It's a solidity-based implementation, and we evaluated it, and we can see uh, Xclaim uses around 205% of collateral, and we can reduce that deposit by 10% uh, for these uh, Alice-type agents. Right, I will close my presentation with uh, the future work, what we're currently doing. Um, so the first point that we look at is um, there's this trend of doing stable coins, and we are looking right now and how to apply balance actually to stable coin protocols. Um, in our initial system model, we essentially had always Alice and Bob, the two agents that interact. Um, but in our case, for example, for stable coins, we don't have a user really on the other side that receives a service, but rather uh, say a pool of users that's unclear who actually is responsible for the individual user. Um, a quite challenging problem is the second one. So uh, let's say we apply balance to a protocol A, and uh, can we then infer that because Alice behaved nicely in protocol A, can we actually lower the deposit for Alice when she participates in protocol B? Um, this led to quite a long journey into composable mechanisms. Um, 
And the last one that we're working on is mostly Lewis's topic. Um, now we can show that we can dynamically adjust the collateral and we can reduce it securely. But the other pretty big open question is how much collateral do we actually need in the first place? Like, what's the starting value that's actually a good value? Do we need 130%, 200%? Um, what's like a good estimate? And with that, I will close my talk. And thank you very much. Open for questions. Please come forward to the microphone for questions. Hi, thanks for the talk, Ivan, Hi. from University of British Columbia. Uh, this is a really nice talk for a like, mechanism design piece of work. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering about this uh, desirable action that you've mentioned multiple times. And you know, to me, it's just kind of an abstract notion. And it seems to kind of you know, work out for the modeling that you've done. But I'm wondering, what, can you give us some examples of what that might be? And what are some constraints of, on desirable actions? Yeah, uh, thank you. Great question. Um, so a practical example, for example, uh, would be in the exclaim protocol um, where you have these functions implemented like the issue and the redeem part or if you want to think about it more concretely um, say you have a smart contract that implements a function and Alice has to call that function and if we um, get a true return if, if it's just a boolean right then we could say she fulfilled the specification if it's a false then uh, she violates the specification uh, so that's really um, if you want to think about implementation perspective, if, if the function returns what we expect it to return, then we're good. Um, yeah. Got it. And in terms of design, is this like something that Bob would be in charge of actually putting together? Or is this something that you imagine the system providing? Like who gets to define these, these uh, functions? Uh, essentially, it would be the designer of the protocol um, that Balance is integrated with. So um, whoever designs a protocol and wants to take balance as, a, as an add-on, um, they would basically say, OK, this and that action, we actually want to have that count for uh, reducing uh, the collateral. Um, and these and that function, we actually don't want to have any impact on the protocol. Um, maybe I can do yeah, one little addition. Uh, essentially, so for example, in, in a couple of protocols, you need to rebalance your collateral. And likely, you don't want to reward actions for rebalancing your collateral, because then agents would purposely just, you know, just go below the value and then get a reward for getting above the value again. And you've got to be a bit careful with uh, how to set the incentives. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. <clears throat> Great question. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, there are a couple of like complicated payment channel like um, structures, and I wonder whether this like kind of fits with them or whether it's complicated. The ones that I have in mind are like the pay rune recursive payment channels. I don't know how to explain it easily other than it's you know nested payment channels within payment channels, and I wonder if you would have nested balance within nested balance, something like that. Uh, great question. Um, I'm not really an expert on payment channels, so I'm, I'm not sure if it were work or applicable for Perun. I looked a bit at Lightning, and then Lightning doesn't really work because it's not over-collateralized. Um, to be honest, uh, it, what we currently look at is, can we actually apply balance to a whole blockchain level and then compose it for different protocols together? Um, the biggest problem we have with that right now is to prove it secure, um, because it's kind of most proving, composable proving frameworks kind of miss that well, notion of, of game theoretic security and the rational agents. So I can't really answer your question in that sense. I'm looking into it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Well, I have a question about this optimal deposit. Uh, I suppose there's no universal optimal deposit for everyone. And um, w then what are the factors that impact the actual optimal value? Um, yeah, now it's kind of, it goes a bit more in the economic finance space. So essentially, uh, if you look at the risks that are behind it, um, each protocol could sort of come up with their own risks. Um, so for example, if you have counterparty risks, uh, most of these decentralized protocols have some sort of centralized party like an Oracle. Um, so you need to account for these kind of different types of risk. And then probably you could calculate the overall uh, risk level. Um, but then uh, Louis, who's sitting behind you, is uh, he's our expert on that. 
Cool. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll wait for the next paper in the future. Thank you <laughs> thank so you. much, Dominic. Let's thank our speaker again.